Let's talk about our friends here. Don't yell it out. Do you know what two species are up there? Don't yell it out. Quietly whisper to the people sitting next to you so that you can feel very smug because you know. So I put up biological names, Canis lupus and Canis latrans. Canis lupus, you know what those are, right? Wolves. Those are gray wolves. Those are gray wolves. Um, Canis latrans. Who can ID that canid? What is it? It's coyote. It's a coyote, and I should, have, I should have found a couple pictures, but we'll get to why that is in a little bit. So let's talk a little bit of history with these two species. Well, let's talk about a little bit of history with these two species, shall we? Recognize this place? That's North America. All of it, the whole thing. Now, unfortunately, if we use the whole thing, I can't fit in everything that I want, but I will mention that prior to European contact, guess which part of this was wolf territory? All. Pretty much all of it, yeah. Um, gray wolves extended across the U.S. through what's now Canada, through now what's now the U.S. Um, there would have been wolves here, um, wolves all through the western U.S., wolves down into what's now Mexico. Um, I'd have to look at what kind of wolf species they had in Central America and South America, but definitely there, there's a Mexican species of wolf. Um, this was all wolf territory. Now, because we're getting there, because we can't fit everything on that map, I'm going to go ahead and use this map for a second. So this is all Canis lupus territory. And Canis lupus is the scientific name for the gray wolf. This was all their territory. But there's an interesting thing. So remember, here we are talking, this is like 1600, or 1500, or 1400. This is pre-European contact with North America. So definitely pre-Ohio statehood. We're not talking about 1803. We're not talking about 1860. We're not talking about 1900. We're not talking about 1957. We're talking about like 1600. There are no white people in this picture. This is Native American territory, and it's all wolf territory. So interestingly enough, in this time period, we also have, we also have in basically this region, we have another canid species, doggy, dogish, dog looking, dog acting species. We have Canis latrans. Oh, that's exactly the question that we're going to answer today. So we have Canis latrans, and they are a western species. They don't live here, 1600. We, there are no coyotes in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia. That's not coyote territory. It is, however, wolf territory. Everything's wolf territory. Coyotes are kind of specialized. They're kind of a western thing. And mind you, the range map that I'm drawing here is the best that I can do off the top of my head. You know, somebody could come along and say, no, there were more coyotes in the Dakotas. Okay, sure, I agree. Whatever. Um, there were coyotes on the northern, on the plains for the most part. They were a plains and desert species. So, you know, we could extend that line. But they definitely didn't live in the forests of the east. What do you know about, well, let's talk about wolves first. What do you know about wolves' niche? So here, I'll, I'll go ahead and resume recording. So for wolves, we're listing all the things we know about their niche. Um, carnivores, predators, they're mostly diurnal. They probably have some activity over a 24-hour cycle. Um, not a whole lot of species just clock out, go to sleep for eight hours, wake up, and do it all over again. A lot of species, you know, may have periods of activity and inactivity all 24 hours. Um, what do you know about how they live? Do they live solo? Do they live in family groups, small, big? Family groups, packs. So it's a family group, and it's a large family group. Okay. There's a documentary. If we have time, I will watch part of it in class, and I'll share the link with you so you can see it on your own. It's about the wolves of Yellowstone, and the, the pack that they follow is about 15 individuals. It's a big group. How big are gray wolves? Does anybody know? Very good. Um, and I think the record for an adult male gray wolf is about 160. So, you know, and that's an adult male... 
Um, we'll, we'll give him a range for adults of like 100 to 160 pounds. Has anybody ever been near a 100-pound dog? Okay. Ooh, okay. 100-pound um, dog is a lot of dog. I used to have a 90-pound dog. I now have an 80-pound dog, and she seems awfully big. And when I think about twice her size, oh, my. Anyway, these are big dogs. <laughs> this is a whole lot of canid, a whole lot of teeth and fur. So now let's talk a little bit about our, our little friend here, Canis Latrans. What do you know about Canis Latrans's niche? So first off, carnivore, herbivore, are they vegetarians? Carnivore. They're a carnivore. Are they a predator? Yeah. Are they anything else? Uh, they can be prey. Too. They can be prey. They are also really fantastic scavengers. Um, and we are, I'm, I want to make it very clear here, we're talking about the western coyote here. So that's going to become important soon. They're scavengers. When I lived in Arizona, um, one of my first coyote sightings, and I saw lots of coyotes in the year and a half I lived out there, um, and this was pretty common. You would see them, you'd be driving through the desert at night, and you would see this dog-like thing darting out and pulling carcasses off the road. They're great scavengers, just like we see possums and turkey vultures, and they have turkey vultures out there too. But coyotes dispose of a lot of carcasses out west. Um, they're great scavengers. They're also good mousers. Um, they eat small rodents, literal mice. They will eat chipmunks. They will eat shrews. They will eat voles. They eat all those little things. Um, how do, what do you know about how coyotes live? Solo, family group? Group, but there's a difference from the wolf to the coyote. Who knows this? It's pairs. It's, it's generally pairs. And very often what you'll find is a pair with last year's cubs, cubs, pups, last year's pups. Um, so you'll find, you know, a mated pair, and they do form long-term bonds. Um, not that, you know, couples don't break up, but they do form pretty long-term bonds, and they will usually have, like, last year's pups with them until last year's pups are ready to go on their own, and they'll, they'll go out and find new territory. But you don't typically find more than a pair and their pups from the last year or so. What do you know about... You probably don't know anything about Western coyotes' size. Some of you will know things about Eastern coyotes' size. Anybody think they know about Western coyote size? What do you think? Nope. Western coyotes are scrawny little things. A big male Western coyote might be 35 pounds. That's like a knee-high dog. So they actually probably range from about 20 to 35 pounds. Um, the first time I saw a coyote up close out west, I was shocked because I thought, that looks like my mom's dog. It's like knee-high and skinny, knocking things over. It's my specialty. Um, they're little. They're little animals. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. Are there any places based on this map, based on what I'm telling you, which, as I said, I drew that map off the top of my head, it's not perfect. Are there any places where wolves and coyotes would come in contact? Yeah, right. The whole coyote range is also wolf territory. Look at their niche. Look at the niche for each species. Is there anything that's going to bring them into conflict? Okay, they're both part. Oh, we forgot a really important part of the coyote's niche. When are coyotes active? They're nocturnal. They are pretty, well, the western coyote is pretty strictly nocturnal. Okay, and we're going to talk about eastern coyotes in a bit. Different thing. All of you getting excited about the coyotes. Um, western coyotes are pretty strictly nocturnal. Why do you suppose that is? Why? Uh, yeah, if you're the 20-pound dog, do you really want to tangle with the 160-pound dog for the same thing? No, because no, they're going to kill me, quite literally. And actually, the, the documentary that we may or may not have time to see a bit of, there's a coyote pair in the territory of this wolf pack, and one of the hardest parts of the documentary to watch for me is the male coyote getting killed by the wolf pack. 
because he attempts to scavenge on their feed site, and they decide they're not done with it after all, and they kill him pretty brutally, because that's what they do, because you mess with our food, you, we make you our food. So yeah, they could very easily compete, but coyotes, there's a strategic advantage to staying the heck out of the wolves' way. So now, let's fast forward about 300 years. So 1900, European Americans have been here for a while, and what's, what's the general theme with predators? Go ahead. Kill them all! Remember, we talked about the Great Hankley Hunt. We've talked about the sort of drive to exterminate predators in all the U.S., Wolf territory now in 1900 consists of some very isolated pockets, um, probably a few places in Yellowstone, some places in the deep mountains of the west, probably a few places up in the Rockies. Um, wolves have been extirpated. What does extirpated mean? Made extinct in a specific local area. They've been extirpated from most of the U.S., Nature hates a vacuum. So if there's something sitting there and nobody else is using it, would you use it? I'm really good at this. You know what? If somebody leaves some cookies in our house for a whole day and they haven't eaten them by now, they clearly don't intend to. So I'm just going to eat them. All that territory. All that territory. Well, coyotes are great opportunists. And coyotes slowly but surely start to spread their range. Because, hey, there's nobody to compete with. It's like realizing that the bully who's picked on you all year has changed schools or has gotten his schedule changed, and he's no longer in your class, so you're free to come out of your shell a little bit. And then something really weird happens. And it happens up here in Canada. I think it happens in Algonquin National Park. I have to look this up. There's a whole documentary on it. Um... You've got some wolves, you've got some coyotes, and they do something that's never been done before. They interbreed. And what comes out of that interbreeding is the eastern coyote. So the eastern coyote is a carnivore, mm -hmm, a predator, a scavenger, um, lives in small family groups, small fam. Um, here's the interesting thing. Who here has seen an eastern coyote out during the day? I have. Who has seen an eastern coyote out at dusk? I have. Who has seen an eastern coyote out in the middle of the night? Okay, I haven't been out in the middle of the night to see them, but some, a lot of people hunt coyotes in the middle of the night. Um, they seem to have a 24-hour activity cycle. Um though they're probably primarily maybe crepuscular, um, but they seem to have activity scattered through a 24-hour cycle. I don't know how they're classed, actually, but they, I mean, just, just a small unscientific sampling here. We've had opportunities to see them at lots of times a day. How big is the eastern coyote? Um, we'll give them um, about 35... I think the record male caught in Ohio the last time I checked was about 65. And I know I've, I've had people say, oh, my uncle shot a 70. Okay, well, official records, because we don't know if your uncle <coughs> cheats when he weighs his coyotes, um, about 65 pounds. Definitely bigger than the little western coyote. Definitely not as big as a wolf. So here's the interesting thing. What's the definition of species, biological definition of species? Do you remember this? No. Well, we said that <coughs> species have to be able to interbreed and have fertile offspring. Does this ring a bell now? We talked about mules and donkeys. Um, they have to share some percentage of DNA. I'm gonna sh I'll move that up. They have to share some percentage of DNA, and they have to have some common physical features. 
And I'll move the, the, the official scientific name of the eastern coyote up here. If you look on the Division of Wildlife website or anything else, you will find the species name for the eastern coyote given as Canis latrans ex lupus. What does that mean? <laughs> well, they bred and, you know, so that's the exact question I want somebody to ask. Does that mean that coyotes and wolves were always the same species and we just had it wrong? If they can breed and they can have fertile offspring, that's kind of the natural question. Probably not. So what is their, what is their name? Canis lupus and Canis latrans. What does the name tell us? They're both Canis, so they have the same what? What's that first part of the name called? Same genus. Same genus. What does that tell us about their relation, relatedness? Well, they definitely have a common ancestor, but it tells us that they're fairly closely related. Are there, other, there are other things in the dog family, in the canid family, that are less closely related. Coyotes and wolves are pretty closely related. And if we did a cladogram, remember those? With horror, I know. If we did a cladogram of those coyotes, those are the line with the lines coming off it and the oh. characteristics, we would find that they share a lot of characteristics. I mean, you know, look at them structurally, they look a lot alike. Furry quadrupeds with pointy noses and pointy ears and bushy tails. Um, they give live birth, they're all mammals, they've got similar teeth and skulls. They're pretty structurally similar. Very different size. There are some differences in the skulls, but pretty structurally similar. And they have some genes they don't share. So when we look at those species, we know they're fairly closely related. Well, when two species are closely related enough, what you can sometimes have happen is a coyote and a wolf breed. Then that hybrid offspring which might not be fertile with another hybrid, breeds back to a coyote and is fertile. And now it's carrying some wolf genes back into the coyotes. So now what you have are, and the name, the fact that it's Latrans ex lupus, they probably have more coyote DNA than they do wolf DNA. And when we look at them, they're closer in a lot of ways to Western coyotes than they are to wolves. If we were to line them up and say, well, you know, which of these things is most alike? We would probably pair up the eastern and western coyote before we pair up the western coyote and a wolf. But they've got wolf genes. They got wolf genes in there. And that gives them some advantages. They took over a whole lot of territory. Now, why were they able to do that? What is true of the niche of the western coyote and the wolf that allowed coyotes to move in so seamlessly? I mean, they, my God, when I was a kid, we didn't have coyotes in all of Ohio. It's, it's been in the last 30 years that they've spread out to that extent. The first reports of coyotes were in the 40s. And when coyotes are common. We all know that. We've all seen coyotes. That wasn't the case even 20 and 30 years ago. They were rare. And, you know, in the 50s, they weren't here at all. Not in this part of Ohio. It's crazy. What allowed them to do that? Look at their niche. There was, a, there was an opening. Niche is like a job description, and nobody was filling that niche. They moved in seamlessly. Do you think a species is more likely to be able to move in and take over a niche for a species. Well, let me ask you this. Why didn't owls take over that niche? Owls are a predator. Why didn't hawks move in and take over that niche? Hawks are a predator. Hawks are a diurnal predator. Why didn't hawks move in and take over the wolf's niche? Talk I heard a few, a few bits and pieces of things that sounded a little bit like, don't be ridiculous, Moser, they're birds. Are hawks and wolves all that closely related? No. Hawks aren't even mammals. So, you know, this is like a classified ad. Wanted. Large predator. Canine preferred. Um, 
must be willing to eat a variety of small prey species with occasional duties for taking down larger prey species. Living in family groups, beneficial. Ability to adapt, helpful. I mean, that's kind of the job description that's out. Um, a hawk is never going to take down a deer. Do you remember the video we watched of the, the deer being taken down in Broadview Heights? By coyotes in the day. <coughs> Species are more likely to be able to take over a niche that belong to something that's related to them. Coyotes and wolves were, had fairly similar niches. I mean, the big glaring differences in their niche were the size of their family groups and their activity cycle, day versus night active. Well, that's not a problem because if the, coy if the wolves get out of the way, I could be active during the day. And coyotes are tremendously adaptable. Um, you got rabbits, I'll eat rabbits. You got mice, I'll eat mice. Ooh, you got leftover pizza crusts in the garbage, I'll eat those. Ooh, you got a half a dead rotting fish on the bank of Guilford? I'll eat that. Ooh, you got a nest of baby birds? I'll eat those too. Not all that picky. <laughs> you got prey out at night? I can be night active. I can do that. You got prey during the day? Oh, I can be day active. I can do that. You got prey that's dawn and dusk active? I can do that too. Which kind of organism, a generalist or a specialist, is more likely to do this kind of niche, I don't know, we should call it niche stealing. I mean, the wolves weren't there. This kind of moving into an open niche. Generalists. Generalists. They're more adaptable. And so they're much more likely to be able to take over a niche that nobody's <laughs> occupying, an unoccupied niche in an ecosystem. Your quizzes tomorrow test, whatever we want to call it, the unit assessment. Um, same as always, a TDQ plus an online version. And part C for the vocab with the globe on it is due tomorrow when you walk in. If you have the wolves, deer, white tails, lime, or not wolves, good grief, white tails, mice, ticks, lime vocab, part C is done, because I think we've done most of those. If you got it done, you can put it in the box. If you're still working on it, that's fine, because those are going to kind of ride through all of this. Now let's think about this, and let's apply this to our lime and white tails management. So in Mill Creek Park, do you think we have white-footed mice? You think we have? Who had the research on mice, shrews, and chipmunks? Okay. Do you think there are some overlaps in the niche of those three species? Probably. Probably. Now they're all they're they're all mammals, but like these guys are all canids. Mice and voles and chipmunks and shrews are all what? Rodents. Rodents. They're all rodents. If you're thinking about this from a competition standpoint, which one of the three or four species I just mentioned did they say was the most efficient transmitter of Lyme? White-footed mice. By far superior vectors for white-footed um, for Lyme. So what would happen if white-footed mouse numbers were to decline if for some reason the ecosystem favored the shrews and the voles and the chipmunks? Do you think we'd see a drop in transmission rates? Those are the kind of things you want to think about. You want to think where niches overlap for different species. You want to think about which species you want to favor. I don't want to favor white-footed mice. They're too good at transmitting Lyme. So that's that's kind of how we want to tie this back to the big project. Okay, so we'll stop there. Um, you can work on vocab.